Let's start it. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to the very first lecture of Motoko Bootcamp number two. Um, I'm really excited to be giving this lecture because uh, it actually is my first uh, time giving a Motoko Bootcamp lecture. Um, because uh, during the last Motoko Bootcamp, I was organizing it, but I was learning Motoko myself along with all the other students. And now that I've got a whole two projects on under my belt, I am officially qualified to, <laughs> to be teaching uh, as a dev mentor. Um, I, I built uh, the NNS proposal submission app. Um, so it makes it more accessible to submit proposals to the NNS because um, previously, before it existed, you had to basically um, like use the fan line to do that. And, uh, and that's actually um, on the, the internet computer dot uh, org samples page as a NNS integration sample. And then I also more recently created Entagle, which um, it, it binds um, unique secure ID uh, NFC tags to uh, physical objects to smart contracts on the IC. So now that I've got, you know, a lot of experience or more experience um, in building with uh, Matoko. Uh, I wanted to share something that was particularly like as I was learning and as I was completely new, I, I struggled to uh, a lot of times to kind of uh, understand the basics of what I was looking at. So the purpose of this talk is to help complete beginners answer the questions, what am I even looking at when they when they open VS Code and they, they have the repo open? Uh, what, what does that file do? And where do I look when I'm troubleshooting? Um, so this is something that didn't, a resource that didn't exist. I talked about being have last time. But um, it's something that I kind of wish I had because I spent my, a lot of time banging my head against the wall, kind of wondering, uh, you know, where a bug was and looking at documentation and figuring out things the hard way. I think a lot of times why this isn't really addressed um, more directly is because there are a whole lot of different ways to, to pit a repo together. So for this particular talk, I was going to focus on the Svelte Motoko starter example. Um, so this is a, a sample made by Definity, and it's it's uh, it's featured in um, on internetcomputer.org. All of the Matoko examples are based on this template. So you can go to that page. You, they've got um, a, a DeFi sample project on there. They've got an encrypted note sample project on there. A lot of neat stuff. They have a, a, a DAO sample on there. Hints, hints. Might be smart to go look at that repo. Um, so after this talk. Uh, what you're going to be looking at on those samples, uh, you know, it'll line up with this talk pretty well. And it's just a good place to start. So there, there, you know, every repo is going to be structured differently. Um, there's, there's not like one way to do things. Um, but hopefully this gives you a good start, especially if you're a complete beginner. And if, you know, most, most of those out there who have done any kind of web app development, this is going to be a little bit too basic. Um, but there is some internet computer specific type stuff. Um, so you can probably just get the slide deck, use it as a reference for the Motoko specific things and, and you know, um, continue on. But for the complete beginners, I'm hoping this will be a useful thing. Um, as you can see from the screenshots, uh, I showed the commands um, for cloning the, the GitHub repo. So a little bit of the command. And uh, in you, the slides I shared beforehand, um, you can go get to all these links um, just by going to the slides there. So let's, let's go ahead and dive in and see what it looks like when uh, you have the first initial file tree. All right, so the initial folder structure, this is what you're gonna see when you copy this code repository from GitHub. Um, so as you can see, I've got, uh, and by the way, those in the room, can you see my mouse? Uh, yeah, you see. All right, so here I have Matoko workspace up in the top corner in my VS Code environment. I've got Svelte Matoko starter, and you can see assets, internet identity, source, um, declarations, front end. All of these. This is the, like the first two levels in um, in this repo. 
when you go about building a front end or, or using different uh, scripts like and like uh, npm scripts it's going to create uh, new files and folders and in, in this case for example uh, node modules didn't exist um, until i ran um, node node run npm run build and it also updates uh, like like if you run a you know uh, npm install it's going to update the packets log json files so the take the basic takeaway is that there are a lot of files that are in the repo that are automated by scripts which you'll seldom ever update yourself and which may or may not show up on github so you know mo node modules i don't know if you've ever went and dug in i've only ever dug in when i find issues uh, or bugs with the packets i'm trying to to work with um it is it is long it, you, it, it is it is a, it goes deep most of the time you won't have to ever really worry about it or think about it much and packets locked as json is 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 very similar to that I, i've rarely ever opened it up but it's the dependencies of your dependencies kind of thing um so you know if you're a beginner like like it's sometimes useful to know what not to focus on as much so next i want to talk about github related files so these are files that are related to the documentation and keeping the external repo organized and clean um every single project that you do should always have a readme.md at the top of the file tree and that's going to show up in github as like the the you know the main uh, text explaining what your repo is all about and uh, uh markdown is very similar i mean it's basically what um is used in discord uh, to make bold text and um and there's and there's more uh, in the documentation link there so you can see how to make headings um you know the, the file for the um the github repo for motoko bootcamp is all done in markdown so everything that you see there you, it can be easily recreated so you can include images and get uh, kind of a, a good it's a good it's a good way to present rich text um and then uh, you'll also see assets and this was something that was a little confusing while completely new to development but um these assets at the very top level are assets that are referenced by like markdown files they're not they're not like public assets used by the um uh, the overall application they're they're used by um by like the readme file so in the very top here you'll see logo.png that's the logo that's used in in the in the readme it's not used anywhere else and it's not really part of the, the app itself the app really doesn't kind of begin until you get into the source up here um and you also have git ignore and git modules files um one thing that's built into this template is a reference to the internet identity repo and the git module file basically connects this external repo for internet identity to that to that folder right there and the intention is that you could um and, and they have more in the readme on how to do this but if you want to do local internet identity development um then then you can basically like hook all of that up um, personally, if I'm a, if I was going to recommend anything to a complete beginner, I would say um, like go ahead and delete that Internet Identity folder entirely and uh, the .git modules entirely, and just deploy it to the network. It's inexpensive, um, and and setting up local uh, developments, it's a, it's a proper thing to do. It's a good thing to do, but it can be really hard, especially for a beginner. And the resources are getting better, but you know you already have the you have the replica environments. You have your internet identity um, uh, kind of kind of uh, like 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 a canister set, and then if you also want to replicate like the NNS, it gets wildly complex to to not only do that on on your local machine properly and get it to all work together, um, but then also to separate everything in in your in your repo between the local side and the, the deployment side. Um, so it can be kind of a hard thing to do. And I think until resources get better for beginners, it's honestly just easier to just deploy um, to the end state. And maybe some people will disagree with that, but I just found it personally easier. Um, so that's a little bit about the GitHub related files. DFX JSON configures how DFX commands are executed to build canisters and interact with the IC. So this is where you're going to go to declare the names and the Motoko, Motoko file locations for your canisters. So you're going to say this is the name, and this is where it can, uh, DFX can find that Motoko file. 
Um, one common issue, like, like if you right now go ahead and clone this repo, you're probably going to get this error. And it's common whenever you, you kind of clone anything. Um, is that the DFX, the DFX version and the DFX JSON file needs to perfectly match the version of DFX that you're using. So if they don't match, um, it could be that the repo is more recently updated and you need to update your, the version of DFX you're running on your machine. Or in most cases, you're running a more updated version on your machine than that repo. And But they have to match. So I even have a screenshot here of what the error looks like. And it's really picky. So in this... Um, DFX JSON declared 12.0, and I have um, I was using 12.1. So all I had to do was go in and change this zero to one, save it, and it clears the issue immediately. Um, here I have a link to the documentation for the schema, and you can see all the different configurations possible within your DFX JSON file. But this is this is one of the most important files that you're going to have, and really one of the first things you're going to do when you're setting up your project is is kind of laying out what canisters you want to create in this file. And next we have package.json. And I'm going to talk a little bit more as to why I highlight this one right here with the big arrow versus the one below it, because there are two package.json. There's one at the top level and there's one two levels lower. Um, so package.json configures the node commands and the packages used to construct your application. Uh, this example shows how the command npm run build is configured to use rollup.js. Rollup so as you can see, you've got scripts uh, listed right here. You have the word build, and then you have rollup, rollup uh, c. Um, so depending on what kind of um, uh, bundler you're going to use, like these kinds of things will change. And you can you can also declare custom scripts. Um, but you know, if you're ever running a command and you, something's not working, an npm command's not working, this is probably where you're going to find an issue or find something that needs to be updated or changed. Um, when you use the, the command lines um, to install or uninstall a front end package, it'll update this automatically. And um, you know, if you leave it open, you can even see it like remove something at the bottom or, or add something at the top. Um, this is also where you declare the, the exact versions for each specific package you're using. Uh, so the documentation for this can be found at this link, and this is not really internet computer specific documentation. A lot of these documentation links aren't, but um, but yeah, so this is all about package.json. And like I said, it automatically creates, based on what you have in your package.json, that automatically creates this package log JSON file. Now, sometimes when you're running into issues, you're like, I updated something, but it's not showing up as updated. Um, it's, it, the way to go about it is to delete this package.lock uh, packet slash lock JSON file completely. And sometimes even just delete the node modules folder entirely and then then regenerate them from scratch and, and that will clear issues up sometimes. So, so keep that in mind. If, if you added a package or updated packets version and, and it's, it looks like, like it's, that's not happening when you expect it to happen, it's probably because you just need to delete those, those generated files and regenerate them in, uh, from scratch. All right, so this particular repo has a unique use case where it's a nested package.json. Um, so the file tree structure that they went for is that they wanted all the front end files nested under source and then under a folder called front end. Now, like I said, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. Um, you don't have to source all of the front, you don't have to uh, package all of the front end files in one place like this. It does make it, you know, nice to work with. And, and really there's a lot of different preferences out there as to why one person might do one folder structure versus another. But in this particular case, they went with this. And for ease of use, they added a top level packets.json file that relays commands to the nested packets.json file. So if you're at the very top of the, of the folder, uh, the file tree, and you, uh, you, you do like npm run build, it won't know what to do because it doesn't see a package.json at that level, right? Um, so, if, but they added this one in, and as you can see, it's got the build command, and it says, "All right, uh, take the command lines uh, two layers down to front end, and then and then relay the same commands down there." Um, and so, this is just an ease of use thing that they added in. So, takeaway is that where you are when you're in your um, command line in the file tree that matters. In, in terms of where, you know, when you're running commands like that. 
rollov.config.js is a bundler config. Um, in, in this particular one, you know, rollups a JavaScript module bundler that compiles small pieces of human readable code into something larger and more optimized like a web application. This repo uses okay, um, other complex front end packages like TypeScript will require their own config files. And this is really something where, where every package is going to have its own documentation, right? So I included a link to rollup he, over here. But if you were going to completely change to use a bundler that you would want to use, um, then you'd, you'd, you wouldn't need this rollup uh, file entirely. And you would have to go to the, the documentation for that package and find out how to set it up to work the way you want. When you run uh, DFX canister creates or the DFX deploy commands, um, it'll generate the canister IDs of your application in a canister underscore IDs.json file that's at the, uh, kind of at the top layer there. Um, so as you can see right here, it has backend IC and it has this. So your, your command line will show, like when you do a deployment, it'll show the IDs of your canisters, but um, if you keep working and, and maybe you, you you got rid of that terminal entirely, like it, that information is always here and it's always going to be uh, like the most accurate one too. Um, so this is a handy a handy thing to look out for. The Toco files always end in .mo, and they're going to get referenced either in dfx.json as a canister or they're going to be referenced by other Matoko files. So I'm, I'm not going to go into writing Matoko because that's <laughs> we have the whole rest of the camp to go into that. But as you can see here, they have source, backend, and then main.mo. And in their DFX file, they show um, uh, they, they show that this is the, the tree and, and, they, and they name it, what is it? They name it backend. So that's how it's declared there. All right, another folder is the declarations folder. This one's also generated automatically by either the DFX generate command or the DFX deploy command. Uh, it's a collection of files that define the declarations and interfaces to connect the public functions of your backend canister to um, the front end languages that you're using. So when, when you're, you're writing stuff on the front end, like say you want um, an input field to uh, show the information um, that comes from a canister call, you're going to be writing JavaScript or TypeScript to, to collect that information. Well, it, it, you're interfacing with the internet computer through Candid, and these de declaration files are kind of all the instructions and, and, and go between so that your front end knows what it's doing when it's trying to get that information from the internet computer. So, um, most of the time, you don't really have to mess with this. It's auto-generated. It is actually a really interesting place to learn um, kind of how all the, the, the piece work comes together. But most of the time, you're not really going to need to do anything here. Occasionally, I've had to delete the declarations and regenerate them from fresh um, for issues. Most of the time, though, you won't need to worry about it. It'll auto-update. So the documentation for that's down here, uh, the CLI reference and with DFX generate. And this last one here, it's really hard to go over the front end folder because it is it is very extremely subjective. Um, there's, there's no exact rules that are followed. Um, there are good practices or general good practices, but everyone likes to set up their front ends a little bit different. Um, so as you can see, I've got front end over here open and I've just opened up everything except for node modules. Because node, 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 node modules is huge. It's almost unwieldy to try to use this type of browser to, to get into something that big. But um, you can see all of the different files under front end in this, in this huge view here. Um, you, one, one file of note that every repo is going to have, every, every web app at least, is the entry file. So in this case, it's the template um, index.html, which is right here under public. And um, you know, I, I actually met, missed the public file. Sometimes the public file uh, folder is also called assets. And it's basically files that need to have an HTML endpoint so that they can be referenced by other parts of the web app. So we see public right here at the top. And you've got a subfolder with images. And this is your definity.svg. This is used on the, on the home page. You've got your favicon.png. That's going to be used um, in the browser tab. Global.css. 
um, self-explanatory. It's the CSS rules. And index.html uh, is right there. So that's the index.html is your entry point. And it just has a, a body tag with nothing between it. And in this particular setup, what happens is the main.js um, is basically goes in and adds the output from the app.svelte file into the body of that HTML template. And more complex web apps, you might have multiple different templates. This is a very simple one. So it just has an index template and that's it. It doesn't have to worry about any other templates. Um, and you, you can see the app.svelte um, set up here. Uh, Svelte is a really great front end uh, framework that I, I love using. It's very simple. Um, so at the very top here, you have all your scripts. So as you can see, it's importing auth from components, it's importing canister IDs from components, and it's importing links from components. And you just end the script tags, and that's all the JavaScript that you need for this for this page. And then you, you start, this is uh, HTML. You just write, you, you just stop writing JavaScript and just go straight into writing HTML, right, right in line here in the same in the same file. And then it even has, oh, sorry. It even has, uh, at the very bottom, you have custom CSS. And um, so th there's a, a spell tutorial that's that's interactive. And within 15 or 30 minutes, you can actually get pretty good at building just most types of things in Svelte. Um, and, uh, you know, like, like it's, it's really smart the way it is. So like if you declare a JavaScript variable up here, then you can just make an input field and bind it to that variable. And whenever that variable's value changes, it will automatically update um, the input field to, to always be the same as that variable's value. And then if you set style tags down here, they'll never conflict. They're going to be spaced to this component. So they're, they're never going to conf conflict with any other components that might be active. Um, and, uh, so next over here, so we've talked about the entry file scripts. These are, uh, usually to save time when working with the repo. So for, for example, there's one script here, which is to set up typescript.js. So you, you basically go to it. It has some, uh, comments and you copy and paste the command from the comments into your command line. And it, um, you know, removes some files, adds some files, like a config file, probably, and makes it so that this repo can use um, uh, TypeScript with Svelte. Um, and so, you know, scripts, it, it's not in every repo, but especially when there's something useful that can be kind of automated when you're working with, 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 uh, with the way you set up your DAP, you, you'll see scripts occasionally. Component-based design. So component-based design, and I copied this from the internet a little bit before this, this talk <laughs> because somebody else had already thought of a good way to describe it. Um, Component-based design is a process um, built on dividing a user interface into a collection of manageable and most importantly, reusable parts that are then used to create an end result, like a page or app screen. And so you'll see a lot of variation. Usually you'll have a component uh, folder like this, and you'll see a lot of variation with subfolders here, because it can really be anything you imagine. But you know, a lot of times you'll have like um, a subfolder called pages, and that's going to be the main like template for each page of your app. And then you might have one where it's like, let's say timer. And once you create that, that timer component, you can then reuse that in multiple pages if you want. So if, if you have like a list and you want a timer for each element in that list, a different timer, um, then, then, you know, you only have to write the timer code once and know that it works and then, and then other components can reference it and they can build on each other. So similar with, with the screenshot, you see, um, you know, app.svelte is the start point. It's kind of where it brings everything together. So it's calling on, on auth, it's calling the canster IDs and it's calling links. And these are, these are components that I would, I would say are more just content components. So it's really, it's more sections of a web page. Um, as far as granularity, I think this is something that there's also a lot of variation in. So some people will get really, really crazy granular um, with what their components are, and it, it goes super deep. So like instead of a timer, they might have like uh, a component for the logic of the timer, a component for the interface of the timer in, you know, like um, in blue with like a loading bit, and then another Another one with like a labels component that you can apply to a timer. You know, you can make it as complicated or as easy as you want. Um, and the, it also depends on what you're building. If you're building a really large, complicated DAP, 
it's good to have lots of components because a lot of different people are going to need to go in and you can have, have lots of reusable parts. If you're building something very, very simple, like you know going into it, it's only going to have two or three pages. Don't make life harder on yourself than it really needs to be. Um, but like I said, there's different schools of thought and different ways of doing things. A store is where you, you store the client side state. So you have state in your app in the back end, which stores, um, you, you know, like you, like the state of like, like what all the, you know, the values are and, and well, you know, like maybe what your users are and what balances they might have, those kinds of things. But you also have client side state. Um, and so you see right here, uh, you've got your store folder and off.js is underneath it. So in, in this case, you're storing the, the information about the logged in user because that's gonna need to be accessible by other components out there. So an example, for example, with the uh, in Taggle, I, I added another file to store just, and that was called tag.js. And it's because when a user um, starts the application, they uh, there's information specific to that tag and uh, and I want to, to reference it in multiple different pages. So any page can, can pull the value of those variables that stays in the state. Um, so here's the link to the Svelte tutorial and a link to the Svelte documentation. Both are extremely high quality. And like I said, if you've never done anything with, with either web development at all before or Svelte in particular, it is probably the quickest framework I've ever seen to pick it up. Um, their, their interactive tutorial live compiles um the examples so you just edit something and it, it will show you if it works or not and so you can play around with every individual feature but it's all pretty intuitive so now it's time for the most valuable part which is the q a and i have seb over in the room in case i say something wrong um <laughs> to, to help support me but I, I don't see any questions um posted in the q a section of uh of zoom oh wait i see an attendee has raised their hands uh, 4EKU, you can talk if you want. I uh, saw you lowered your hand though, so I don't know if you're still game for it. Okay, that's fine. All right. So anonymous attendee asks, what kind of backend action is um, is normally happens? Uh, I think you're asking like like what does the backend do? Um, and what will it really? I mean, that's that's kind of the whole. Uh, that's like asking what does your application do, right? I mean, it's it's the core logic. Of, of what you're building. And so what, what are you gonna be doing when you, you start building your Matoko file is you're gonna decide what are the public functions that need to exist for this to have the functionality that I want it to have. So like if you're making a note-taking app, there needs to be a function to add a note, to delete a note, um, to change a note, um, and uh, maybe to pull all the notes and get a, a list of notes. So like those are going to be basic functions. So that's the kind of action that normally happens in the back end. Another person asks, where is the PowerPoint uploaded on the Discord announcements page? Um, I included the join link to this uh, session, but I also included a, a, a read access link to these slides. And uh, I'll probably find, we'll probably find a, a way to put it into some kind of reference or resources um, channel. We might make that just to make it easy. Can you host email on the IC? Somebody has already answered that, dmail.ai. So yes, you can. Any requirements to front end frameworks we need to use during this week? Um, so not, not really, it's Motoko Bootcamp. Last time, uh, we we had a little bit less guidance and and help with the core project, but but this time around we've gotten some stuff ready. So so essentially, um, and you, this should all be made clear in the, in the core project .md file in the in the GitHub for Matoka Bootcamp. But um, uh, my understanding is that basically you just have to worry about the backend Matoka files and um, and hooking those up 
to the front end, but you don't really have to do any front end work, at least for the basic requirements. But if you want to, uh, you know, build a like a graduate with honors, you might need to do a little bit of front end work. And I, I want to say, I mean, yeah, the the front end it, it uses Svelte. I don't I don't know if it uses the Svelte Motoko starter template that were used in this example, but it'll be very similar because it does use Svelte. And um, and, and so yeah, I mean, and, and you will have to work with the front end in terms of like getting your code to build and compile so you can deploy it. I mean, that's pretty important, right? So you need, and there's a little bit there, but you can use whatever you want. So if you're already strong in the front end and you're comfortable and you're like, I like React, I can't stand Svelte, whatever, completely replace the the what we the front end we supply with whatever you want so that it's easy for you. Um, so if you already know and feel confident in a certain front end framework, feel free to use it. That's not a graduate dependent requirement. All right. Um, do you have links included in this webinar posted somewhere? I answered that already a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's on Disc Discord announcements. Where to host the front end files? Um, well, not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, you're going to be working on your repo locally, and then it's uh, always good practice in general, but also for your submission, it needs to be published to GitHub. Um, but all your files do. It's not your front end files specifically. And if you're asking about where is the front end hosting, that's on the internet computer. It's all it's all 100% um, um, on chain, which is different than any other um, blockchain. Typically, you'll have to get another hosting provider like um, like AWS, and then a uh, to connect to the blockchain, you get someone like Infura to um, to give you a service that get, provides an API to the blockchain. And so there's all these different complex services you've got to hook up. But with the IC, um, what you saw there is all you need, and you just hit deploy. And it makes a front end a, a, a front end canister that doesn't really have any logic other than spit out the HTML when people uh, load the web page. And then the backend logic that takes all of, that exposes the public functions and, and, and everything that needs to happen to connect to that front end. All right, so someone asked here, I'm just wondering if Svelte is better than React or simpler and it's why we are going to use it or we can use other frameworks like React. And we already answered that earlier. In my opinion, it's easier, that's subjective, but I digress. Can I export an identity and import it in another PC? Yes, there's a way to do that. Um, the, the main guide has a, um, a link to the, the, the DFX, um, uh, kind of like the DFX documentation. It's a .pim file. I'm not sure offhand, I don't remember offhand exactly where it's stored, but, but basically it's kind of like your secret keys for your identity. So it, it is a it is something that can be done. Oh, and I see somebody here. Okay, they already the the effects identity export name everything. That's nice. I didn't know it's already a command. Yeah, nice. All right, Jesse asks, what other files are mandatory to, uh, to manually set on top of .mo and .html and .js uh, files? Um. I mean, nothing other than what you saw. What you saw is everything that goes into that repo to make that that sample dApp project. It, and it's just a hello world sample dApp, it's nothing complicated, but there's no other files um, to show. I'm, everything I showed earlier was complete. Can you use another file structure in your core project? Yes, we don't care about your file structures, about functionality. So, you know, if you if you, if you you feel the need, like I said, file structure is, is, is kind of subjective. Um, now you need to reference everything so that it all works and compiles, right? But yeah, if you if you feel comfortable setting up with different file structures, feel free to. And I already answered this one. Is Matoka Bootcamp going to be learning backend or front end or both? You're learning backend Matoko. Higher level concepts or more general concepts of backend are computer science in general, and that's not really the scope. I mean, we, we can't teach you a, a computer, you know, all about computer science in one week. Um, but at the basics of like what a function is, like you, there will be the, the basics you need for your core projects will be covered. Um, it's just that there's a lot more to that that expands upon that. 
Um, and front end, like I said, it's not the focus of this camp. So you should be able to get enough requirements to graduate without having to, to do much. But I mean, unless you know enough HTML, JavaScript, and CSS to, to like even know what you're looking at to get the most, to, to like get your, your repo like, like functional, um, that'd be really hard. But those are all very easy languages to learn. Um, you know, you can pretty much get any, there, there's lots of resources online. So you can Google whatever question you have and you'll find Stack Overflow answers for it pretty much. Yeah, so DFX deploy, um, what somebody asked, so DFX deploy will automatically handle most of, of these files. So DFX deploy is, is useful because it, it kind of bundles in several different DFX commands at once. Um, I remember over a year ago when, when I was first getting started, there was like a list of four different commands that you had to enter in a certain order when you're deploying. Um, but they, they kind of just bundled that all into one. So I want to say it's uh, DFX create canisters, DFX build, and um, and then I think there's DFX deploy was like a different one until they bundled all those, those two previous into it. But but yeah, so uh, I usually personally will just use DFX deploy. Which library do we have to download for this in Visual Studio? Um, I mean, I was cloning a repo on off GitHub. And as you can see the screenshot for the commands on that, um, you can also just Google how do you clone a repo in GitHub. I mean, honestly, the answers to most questions, you're going to be Googling a lot. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and, but but that's that's how we got all of those. So it's on the, it's on the first slide. And uh, in Visual Studio, one thing I want to say is like make sure, and we've mentioned it before, but I think people miss it a lot. There's a, a Motoko extension. And so a lot of people were asking in Discord, like, why isn't my code compiling? Well, if they had just had the Matoko extension, it, it, it will highlight most errors, um, like most blatant errors. It actually catches quite a lot. It's a surprising amount. So um, so yeah, if you forget to capitalize a type when you declare a type or something simple like that, it saves you the time from having to like, like, like wonder and scratch your head and look through everything line by line. Um, so in VS Code, look at extensions. There's a Matoko file um, extension that's really useful. How can I call the who am I function from the terminal? Terminal, um, it's a DFX call. So, uh, oh, the who am I, am I function? Yeah, it's DFX identify identity who am I. Um, I, I thought you were talking about the function as an example. It's, um, I think the function is named greet. And you you provide a parameter which is text, and then it just sends back hi, and then whatever text you entered. Um, so uh, DFX identity who am I is what you if, what do to find out your identity. You can also do a DFX identity list to see all the identities, and it, it puts a little asterisk next to one you're using, so you can have multiple identities. Um, it's a point of preference. I typically will use the default to deploy to locally, and I have one named Isaac when I want to deploy on chain and that way i don't get the wallets mixed up between like like um like, like my real cycle wallet mixed up but um everyone has a different way of doing it is there anywhere i can get the upcoming videos for the rest of the day yeah so that's going to be discord discord's going to be where most of the stuff happens it's going to it's our it's, as we mentioned in, in the kickoff it's like the communication central hub for for the boot camp so um we're, we're going to make sure that the links to all of the previous videos are easy to find um, as long as you stay on Discord. Someone asked, can you explain the, the dissolve for honors? I'm assuming that's a typo. Um, but basically, we have these bare minimum requirements for a DAO, and it's such a simple DAO. It's, it's, it's hard to even call it a DAO, but it's, it's, it's a baby DAO. Um, and that's the general requirements for, for getting graduation. And then we added extra requirements that go beyond that. And that's all specified in, in the core project.md file. But um, but yeah, that, that's that's how you get honors. And then um, you have to add functions that we didn't even pit requirements for or specify for um, for top of class. And then um, the, the top three will, well, honestly, it's, it's um, there are some people that come into this boot camp and just blow things away. We were just talking earlier about how incredible some of the work was from the um, from the first one. We gave very simple requirements and people built a lot more than I expected to be built in, in a week. So um, that's an exciting thing. All right. Somebody, uh, Tom McCann asks, 
where there'd be an overview of all the different IDs related to the IC, which is principles, public key, internet ID, controllers, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be one of the upcoming daily modules. So we have like a, like a kind of a, uh, uh, I forgot what step called it exactly, but it, it's like a the, the lesson plan for the day where it's just educational content and it's not no challenges. Um, and there's going to be one at, on day four, I believe, is the one on principles and accounts. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there is a lot, like, like there was very sparse documentation from Definity in the beginning, but it has gotten better. More recently, I found out, for example, that um, that there are four different types of principles, and you can actually make it so that your function will only accept calls from canisters or only accept calls from um, uh, from the type of principles that are assigned to users. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of great information there coming out. Someone asked, does next.js work on the IC or only React and Svelte? Anything that compiles to um, WebAssembly can work, and you really have your choice of whatever framework you want. So, um, we've seen I've seen uh, I've seen Next.js. There's uh, a repo, and I think we have this resource. Um, it's it's under the main guide. You know, we had that big list of resources on on the main bootcamp GitHub. There's one towards the bottom where it's a uh, it, it lets you pick whatever framework that you want. And I'm pretty sure next is is in there. But yeah, most front end stuff, you can pretty much do whatever you want and it's, it'll all still work. Any best practices for testing the Motoko canister? I'm not the qualified one for answering that. Um, we have a, a whole lecture on that coming up by someone way more qualified than I am on that particular topic. I will say that another resource that's super handy that's listed on, on that, um, that uh that main guide and on our github is uh the candid ui um so you just go to that web that, that url and put in your canister id and it will show all of the public functions for that backend canister and you can even call them and like test them out um so that's a great way to kind of like it's a great interface and it also for other canisters out in the ecosystem you can put them in there and see what their functions are so like if you want to see how an NFT works. You can you can put their backend canisters ID in there and see all the different endpoints and, and uh, public functions, what the outputs are, what the inputs are, and how they work. Um, so someone asked, I tried to, to DFX deploy the starter packets, but I'm getting an error. Do I need to create a local instance of ICB chain to run deploy? No, you don't. Um, you, and, and this is one of the confusing things, and we, we have other things referencing it, but uh, DFX, you start off your DFX command with DFX, then you have the next part, which is um, uh, like what command, so like deploy or canister or wallet in one word. And then the space after that, if you leave it blank, or if you, if you just go on with whatever other parameters for that command, it will assume you wanna uh, do it locally. So if you just put in DFX deploy, it thinks you want to just deploy locally, and it's going to say you need to you need to start running a local chain or local replica. It, you have to pit um, dash dash network IC to specify that you want that command to apply to the the real live um, network that we can all access on the internet. So that is a little bit of a confusing thing, and we've mentioned it before. But with with beginners, it's always good to reiterate that. So try DFX deploy dash dash network IC. And and that's that that may, maybe will help. Someone say here. So what does it mean that everything will deploy in the IC and no database needed at all? Um, and yeah, and someone else has, has already asked this. Uh, you know, main dot mo file will work as as a database. There's there's going to be more talks on this, but a canister can hold storage. Um. But what I specifically said earlier was that there's no um, hosting um, needed, no no Web2 hosting needed for the front end. And like I said, all other blockchains, you can have a small amount of logic in the back end that applies to the smart contracts, but it really, it's too expensive on Ethereum to store any anything meaningful. Um, so it, all it can do is give you an interface, apply a little bit of logic and connect to something else. 
Um, so if you want to store large amounts of information, you have to use like FPS or something. If you want to store a front end for a website, for an application, then you need to, to use like AWS or something. But with, with IC, it's all simplified. All that's abstracted away. You just um, you apply what logic you want to in the back end. You store what uh, data you need right in there. And your front end as well can be 100% on-chain. All right, Samil asks, will we need many cycles to run projects? And will we get them as much as needed or need to buy ICP to run it? Um, yeah, you need cycles to run your projects, but you'd be surprised at how far they stretch. So like once you get enough cycles to deploy the canisters that you need, that's that's plenty. I mean, like the hello world dap, I mean, yeah, I can't a little bit of cycles are used when you call that function. But like unless you have like 10,000 people an hour um, uh, trying to call your little hello function, you're never going to get any meaningful amounts. Can you say something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say it's possible to get back cycles from canisters that you've deployed. Uh, so we'll put um, a guide or the command uh, on the Discord. But for the application that you've already deployed, you can get back most of the cycles. So if you're running out, you should be good. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can you could reuse it. I mean, if you already um, you already deployed that canister for, for getting uh, into enrollment, you can just update the repo for it and and um, and, and and keep using um, that same canister you deployed. I've done that before, um, but but really, it's not like you're going to need to keep going back and buying cycles. They're so cheap that the cycles you have now should should do plenty. And really, until you have a point where you have so many users um, and they create something super useful, is, is where you really need to start thinking about like optimizing cycles, and that might be becoming a problem. So NFT collection said, so can you go back to the point where you said it's better to deploy onto the network rather than locally, the part about deleting the, the internet identity folder? Um, I probably shouldn't. I mean, it, it's it's not really like, uh, it's probably recommended that, that people learn how to properly do um, local deployment testing. Um, and and I'll, and I'd say that you know it is worth putting in the effort, but I, if you're a complete and total beginner and you just want to get something on chain quickly to to like um, you know, like early in your learning experience, um, I, I said I personally have found it easier to just deploy real canisters and just update them and 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 test them by refreshing my browser. Um, then um, then it, it can get complicated trying to recreate internet identity. Like I've run into lots of issues where. I can't log in to the local replica of internet identity properly um, to, to, to test things out. Um, there's, just, I think part of it is they're still kind of building the local testing infrastructure a bit. I think the most recent, like a month or two ago, DFX added some improvements and I personally haven't gone through the documentation on those improvements. So maybe it's a lot easier now, but um, especially when you're trying to interact with other cancers. I mean, think of like, for example, the local canister IDs are going to be different than the real life canister IDs that never change. And so everywhere that you're referencing any other canisters that you want your application needs to interface with, it's going to have to, you're going to have to have a local version and a, a um, and, and like the, the IC version. And it just gets really, really complicated to make your code base elegantly make that transition. Um, and frankly, at the end of the day, after you do all, do all your local testing, then you still it's a good idea to do like a staging, like a live on IC staging deployment, just to make sure that when the rubber hits the road and it really is truly live, that it all really does keep working. So I personally am just like, well, I'll just, I'll just deploy it. And um, and then once it's all like, like I'm ready for production and I know it's working because I have the staging environment that, I, that I've been deploying is working, I just copy my repo and then, and then publish the, the the production ready version. So that's how I found it to be easiest. Someone asked, can I work on my repo or challenges with older DFX versions such as 11.2? I would say I would recommend not to. I highly recommend to use the more updated versions of DFX. The older versions are going to have different command syntax. I think they changed a couple of commands around here and there. And and it's just so something so new as DFX, like they're adding a lot of basic good stuff with each update. I don't miss an update. Just use the most recent version of DFX.
Uh, someone asked to be taken through the core project documentation. Uh, I don't think we have enough time for that, but um, but you know, screenshot a particular question or just ask the questions on the the Discord Ask Questions channel, and um, that's what I that would be probably the best place. I make make a topic on the Discord Ask Questions channel. Someone that says the Ethereum smart contract has a lot of attacks regarding the re-entry attack or arbitrary errors. IC smart contract has the possibility of facing the same issues. Um, they're completely different animals. I mean, IC is going to have its own different security concerns. We have two dev mentors who are current Definity employees who are going to be talking specifically on the lecture about security. So I'd really defer to them. And they talk about like randomness and different things. Um, but but generally, uh, an application that you deploy is going to be secure by default. Everything with internet identity is private by default. Um, so I mean, a lot of co security considerations have are have been abstracted away and taken care of for you. But that's not to say you don't need to think about security at all when you're building. Um, a lot of times, the at least for beginners, one of the most basic things you need to be thinking of is. Um, just because you don't display something in the front end that's a public function, um, it doesn't mean that somebody can't access it. If it's a public function, they can directly access it no matter what, as long as they know your canister ID. They could go to the Candid uh, UI interface I described earlier, or they can use the command line. So you've got to be very, very careful what those public functions do, what information that they share, what they control. And, and pick qualifiers to make sure that only somebody who owns that account can make changes to that account. Because if it's just a public function that takes that account holder's ID, account ID and, and doesn't make sure that the, the caller is the owner of that account, then, then, then you can have security concerns. Just be very careful with what the public functions do. Someone asks if you could tell us more about internet identity and how we can create it. Um, all of this, is so that internet identity subfolder, like I said, that was trying to reference a different repo for the sake of replicating internet identity itself in your local environment, but you don't need that folder. If you deleted that and got rid of it, when you deploy, um, internet identity login will still be in the main DAP um, because it uses agent.js to, um, to, 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 to make that integration happen. And we have a whole lecture coming up on identity um, and, and there's a lot of um, internet identity documentation out there. So I'm not gonna get too into it, but basically it's it's Definity's, um, I, like, like uh, Definity produced an identity uh, solution and that's internet identity. And it has it has certain perks, um, but like plug wallet, for example, is or, or stoic wallet, um, those are, are are different identity solutions. NFID, the, the creator and founder of NFID, which is the like one of the coolest um, solutions out there is gonna be doing a talk on, on identity. So um, his name's Dan and uh, NFID now allows dApps to, on the IC to use um, the login with Gmail, which is pretty earth shattering that you can do login with Gmail on a dApp. And it does other neat things like like keeping you private across different dApps and, and, and uh, um, choosing what information you search. It's a whole identity solution. So yeah, identity is a big topic and uh, I won't go into it too far, but um, but yeah, this repo, the way you see it, it already has internet identities um, integration plugged into it. Someone asks, uh, at what stage declaration folder comes up, create, build, or install? Um, it's, it's, it's actually, it, it's, uh, I want to say it, it, it's a DFX generates, but like I said, I, I typically use DFX deploy. So DFX deploy bundles up, creates, build, generates, and install. So like those those four commands, they're independent and they all do independent things. And there will be use cases when you're doing certain things where you might want to use them independently. But um, but like I said, you just type in DFX deploy and all four of them of those commands are done in the background. And just, just as if you had done them one after another. Do you recommend any extensions beyond the Matoko extension? Uh, yeah, somebody said WebAssembly. Um, 
you know, any, anything related to your front end. So like if you're using TypeScript, you want to get a TypeScript one that highlights things properly for TypeScript and then anything for like JavaScript, um, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, really look at, look at how you're pitting together your front ends and um, just browse the extension store for stuff that might look like useful. But um, really the Matoka one's the only one for this particular bootcamp that really is, is super useful. In relation to the Bitcoin integration, explain to me how the Bitcoin canister implemented is implemented, the architecture. Um, well, we have a whole talk on that. Um, and so it's, it is a, that's, that's the topic for a whole nother lecture. Um, it is pretty neat, though, because basically a subnet itself is able to have a secret key that no node provider on the subnet or in no particular canister itself has and, and sign transactions on the Bitcoin um, blockchain itself. So we've you've basically got a a blockchain um, actor controlled by smart contracts on the EIC that are interacting with the Bitcoin blockchain in a way that the Bitcoin can't tell it's not like an, just another user. And in that way, it's not a bridge because you're, you're, you're manipulating Bitcoin directly. You're just using IC smart contracts to do it, which is um, pretty groundbreaking. And uh, and that's why it's, we call it bridgeless. So there's a lot of really exciting aspects of that. And and when you think about going and we're adding uh, Ethereum, it's on the roadmap to add Ethereum next, I believe. But that adds all um, that should basically also involve all of the Ethereum based stuff, like uh, all the tokens and um, and probably even layer twos. And uh, and then by the time you get to Ethereum network and, and, and all the Ethereum based things and being able to interoperate with uh, with that and the IC, I think the the implications are pretty huge. And even as things stand right now, you can um, make front ends on the IC for other blockchains. So like I said, most other blockchains, they they just have some backend logic and they use a centralized um, like AWS for the front end. Right now, with the functionality we have today, you can make a front end for any other um, any other blockchain protocol application that you want. So like somebody. There's like liquidity protocol, which is 0% um, interest Ethereum loans. And um, somebody made water slide, which is just a front end for that. And, and it's hosted entirely on chain. So yeah, why don't you go, you know, go ahead and try at some point in your learning uh, a career to make a, a front end for an existing ETH app, um, just to show everyone how cool it is and make it fully decentralized for once. Um, we also have a Uniswap front end. I forgot the details of that, but it exists out there in ecosystem. All right, what are the cons of hosting the front end on the IC versus uh, examples like uh, Firebase or other Web2 slash cloud providers? Um, I mean, I think stats-wise, there might be some amount of, uh, of it being slightly lower on performance because um, I don't think that it can it can quite be at the same level as 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 those at least not yet but i don't really don't think it's worth the effort to go out of your way to try to separate out the hosting for the front end onto a different provider because i think they're pro you're probably running into issues and complexities with like like hooking everything up back properly um between like the like the dfx declarations i think you there'd be a lot of weird stuff you'd have unique things you have to do there and then um like the the authentication stuff there's a lot of security stuff related to how agent js is implemented and i don't know how that would be impacted if you tried to do something like that so really i don't see any pros to trying to take that route you're, you're risking a lot for maybe a performance benefit that almost no one will ever notice so i would say just stick to keeping everything hosted on the on the ic front and back I and mean, why not do it just because you can right Someone asks, uh, can you develop tokens or coins on your inner computer? Yes, and you will be interacting with them uh, this week with your uh, uh, core project. Um, we have a token faucet, and you need to integrate with the token canister um, to, to you know, transfer tokens around and see how many is in a balance of a user, that kind of thing. So yeah, tokens can be developed. And and NFTs can be developed. We did NFTs last last uh, time. Um, but further than that, 
the entire meaning of what a token is or what an NFT is can be expanded on the IC in ways that aren't possible with other blockchains. Um, so uh, I won't, I won't, I, I could talk an hour just on that aspect alone, but we'll continue on here. Frederick asked, how do I upgrade, adapt to the latest version of DFX? You know, you've got DFX upgrade. And like I said, you, you just need to make sure that the DFX.json file um, lists the latest version of DFX on there. Yeah, so I see Wenzel's already answered somebody here who asked, was, is it possible to go from cycles back to ICP in order to treat cycles as a stable coin? Wenzel says, no, there are ways to exchange, but you can be selling cycles, for, you'll be selling cycles for a discount, and that's true. There is XTC, which is, um, what, it's basically a tokenized um, wrapped um, uh, version of cycles. Uh, one XTC is equal to one trillion cycles. Um, Sonic OOO is where you can like find that. And there's a, uh, an AMM for that and everything too. Um, but, but, and, and I think the price for cycles and XTC is actually cheaper than, um, than turning ICP into cycles. So that is something to think about. Like, I think a lot of like, like you, you, you want to look for the rate for like going rate for buying cycles, um, as, as, as a wrap to XTC on, on exchange and the rate for, um, for converting it uh, from ICP and the rate for converting from ICP changes by the NNS it's updated because uh, a cycle is uh, one trillion cycles is supposed to e equal one SDR, which is the world international banks currency. So basically a basket of global currencies. So we've set a cycle to kind of like be stable in, in terms of its ratio to ICP in, in that in terms of that value. But, but yeah, it might actually be cheaper. Um, on uh on sonic solana and ic use russ's language solana is pretty fast and cheap what is the primary difference between the two? Oh, solana sucks is the primary difference <laughs> um, and, uh, solana is actually a lot slower than the ic like like orders of magnitude slower um and it, it's a whole different protocol that comes with entirely different um uh, pros and cons i would say solana is a little bit more designed to be you know, closer to what I guess you could call a traditional blockchain, whereas the IC is rethinking, uh, really not even just rethinking what a traditional blockchain is, but rethinking like hosting and network, what a network is entirely itself. So um, yeah, it's, they're different animals, um, but Solana is not doing too well right now. So we're excited because we've seen a lot of Rust developers switching over to IC and, and the IC is, is, um, yeah, aside from its speed, it's just got a lot of other pros, um, like gasless transactions, and you you can't host front ends on Solana and stuff like that. Uh, we're past time here. I'll, I'll see if I can answer a couple more um, because we do we leave time between lectures on purpose, just in case Q and A goes a little bit long. Uh, what is the best practices to support Verzine and production app? like v1 or v2 i don't know um i think i think there's probably some best practices out there but frankly if there are i don't really exactly know them i mean it's supposed to be that if it's like a major version then it's it's going to be like almost a whole different app like a like a major rollout and if it's a smaller tweaks it's just a, a smaller point so i would just kind of stick with what you see in other repos and what seems to be the standard um so i wouldn't do just v1 or v2 i'd do like v0.0 to 1 and dot 1 or something like that and then and then with the major versions go up but frankly that's i feel like it's a little bit of a subjective question uh seb how much is the current memory capacity of a canister i forgot offhand is it 30 this is uh, a challenge they have to solve. So ah, oh, we're not. This is a challenge that they're supposed to solve. Someone's someone's trying to get me to do their homework. I see. I see. Huh. All right. All right. Someone says thanks for lecture. It's like drinking from a fire hose. Can you give me a quick recap before concluding? Well, I got to the slides, and you have the recording. Um, I don't have enough time to do the whole thing again. Um, but 
imagine what it's like when nobody sits down and tells you anything about the repo. You're just supposed to start messing with it. That's why I want to add this talk, just so that there's at least some general guide map for people who are new to, uh, you know, new to this completely. Uh, if on a new project, do you suggest using VS Code when interacting with GitHub or do you use a terminal to run GitHub commands? I mean, oh, yeah, that's right. I forget that VS Code has an integration where you can kind of do GitHub stuff through its UI rather than uh, just use the, the the CLI commands for GitHub. It's it's good as a developer in general and as a whole to get really comfortable using GitHub from the command line. Um, there are features, as you can see, I, I've never I've never really used the UI in VS Code. I, there are, I know that those features exist. I think it's useful to like see how VS Code will like highlight stuff. Like it, when you make changes that aren't committed yet, I think it puts a little dot next to it and stuff like that. But but use the command line. That's just that's going to be really good practice with the command line and also faster and 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 also just a skill that you need to sharpen as you go into your career further. How do you compare the hosting part of ICP with Filecoin or Crust Network to centralization storage? Um, I mean, that's that's a complicated question. I, I'm not sure I'm really qualified to go into all the pros and cons. I will say that what's nice about it with the IC is that's all integrated in one solution. Because a lot of times with development, you can you feel like you're just hooking in all these different services that each do only one thing, but the IC does all of them at least pretty darn well. So um I think it's I think it's it's speed. I, I'm, I'm if it's not as fast, if it's not faster, it's it's as as fast or, or or very close to that with compared to anything else I've ever heard of. I mean, we usually, when it comes to stats, blow up just about everything under the water. So I haven't really seen anybody make an attempt to use Filecoin or Crest Network with the IC. It's, it may be possible, but it's one of those things where it's probably not enough benefit to justify trying. It's just easier to just host it. Uh, what's the most popular token for the internet computer? And somebody's saying, "Is that how's that concern this class?" Um, yeah, I don't even know. I don't. Uh, we have a few of meme tokens, but that's about it. All right. All right. I think that's it. So we're eight minutes over. I'm going to wrap this up. But hey, thanks for everyone attend who attended. I hope this was useful, and y'all have a great rest of your day.